Hello everybody, my name is David Gully and this is the first of four videos on the reserves market. So this will be uh, of the four videos, we are going to go over the basic reserves market, then we'll go through how the Fed used to change the federal funds rate using the reserves market, then we'll talk about the introduction of interest on reserves and the ONRRP facility, uh, and then finally we will use uh, the IOR and ONRP facilities to talk about how the Fed now changes the federal funds rate. And for additional videos, uh, please visit our YouTube channel. And so what we want to look at here is uh, the answer to a question. So this will be the main question we'll be dealing with in this video. How is the federal funds rate determined? And the bottom line answer is that it is good old supply and demand. And what we want to emphasize here in this video, this talks about the pre-2008 uh, market for reserves. In future videos, we'll talk about the post-2008 market. And so what we want to get to is uh, this picture here. And at the end of the day, as you'll see here when we're finished, is we'll have nothing more than a standard supply and demand analysis where we'll see that the equilibrium federal funds rate is, say, for example, uh, with my fake numbers here, is 5%. And so we'll want to derive or invent or show where this interesting looking demand curve comes from and this very interesting looking supply curves come from. So first, let's talk about the market for reserves. And so in terms of what reserves are, they're a component of uh, the monetary base. And the monetary base is reserves plus currency and circulation. Uh, reserves can either be required, that is, by law, banks have to hold a certain minimum volume of reserves, or they can be excess reserves, reserves that banks hold above and beyond those that are required by the Fed. And in other videos in our YouTube channel, uh, we've demonstrated uh, how a change in reserves can change the money supply. And so what we want to do here is go more into depth on the market of reserves. And so on the supply side, what we'll see is that the supply is pretty much completely determined by the Fed, but on the demand side for reserves is determined by the Fed, banks, and the general public. And what we want to see here is how changes in supply and demand in the reserves market affect the federal funds rate. And so some preliminaries here. And so banks, it turns out, can trade reserves amongst themselves. And so the question is, well, gosh, why would they do this? Well, as we discussed a second ago, uh, the Fed by law sets the minimum required reserves. And so in the entire banking system, the minimum volume of reserves is given by uh, the little formula there. The total required reserves is equal to the reserve uh, requirement ratio times demand deposits. So for example, if deposits are $100 and the reserve requirement is 10%, required reserves would be $10. And it turns out that banks don't have to meet uh, reserve requirements uh, every minute of every business day. They only need to meet the reserve requirements over a given two-week reserves period. And so what happens is that for a variety of reasons, some banks end up being short of reserves over the two-week period, and some banks end up having excess reserves above and beyond that they are required to have. And what happen then, happens then is a bank uh, with, that is short of reserves will end up trading with a bank that has excess reserves. And the reason the bank that is short of reserves will end up trading is that being caught short um, of required reserves uh, can be very costly in terms of penalties uh, from the Fed. And so effectively a natural market uh, uh, was created when banks short of reserves and banks with excess reserves traded amongst one another. And when all is said and done, the equilibrium interest rate uh, in this market is what is known as the federal funds rate. So the federal funds rate is nothing more than the um, equilibrium interest rate in the market for bank reserves. Now, so let's first look at the demand for reserves. So this is a function of three things. The required reserve ratio, which is set by the Fed, and that's 10% right now on demand deposits deposits that are subject to reserve, so right now only demand deposits are subject to reserve, and the federal funds rate. And so at the moment, uh, as we all know, is the Fed pays interest on reserves. So let's assume, just for the sake of argument, for the purposes of this video, that that is currently not the case. Uh, so if the Fed doesn't pay interest, the federal funds rate, in effect, represents an opportunity cost of holding reserves. And the reason for this is that if banks hold a dollar of reserves with the Fed, the Fed doesn't pay interest, and banks can also hold reserves in the form of vault cash. That, of course, doesn't pay interest. And so the federal funds rate really is an opportunity cost of holding reserves. And other factors equal, if that opportunity cost rises, banks will hold fewer reserves. And so if you graph the federal funds rate against the demand for reserves, that is, will be, you know, have a standard downward slope. Now, let's suppose, just for the sake of argument, that the federal funds rate increases. Well, banks on average 
having a higher opportunity cost would hold fewer and fewer reserves. But it turns out there's a limit to how few reserves they'll actually hold. And so the question arises, well, what is the limit? Well, if you look at the required reserve ratio times the volume of demand deposits, the curve, the demand curve becomes vertical. And the reason for this is that system-wide, that's the minimum aggregate level that banks have to hold in terms of the total volume of reserves. And so once that minimum volume is reached, then the demand curves become perfectly inelastic. And so that would be right here. And so if you draw down here, that's the required reserve times the volume of demand deposits. So system-wide, banks cannot hold fewer reserves than that. And as you can see, under normal circumstances, the demand curve would have a downward slope. And a reminder here, I've drawn the downward sloping part as a straight line only for convenience. It does not need to be a straight, straight line in real life. So summary of demand here. So under normal circumstances, the demand curve has a standard downward slope. And that's because it represents an opportunity cost. And once banks system-wide meet the minimum reserve requirements, then collectively the, that constraint is met. And that's when the demand curve becomes perfectly inelastic. Okay, now we turn to the supply of reserves. And so we had a slightly unusual looking demand curve that had a standard downward sloping part and a perfectly vertical part. Well, the supply curve for reserves is actually more unusual, but still has many common characteristics of a supply curve. So let's assume, just for the sake of, uh, of argument, that the Fed has complete control over the supply of reserves. Now, this is 100% accurate, but as we'll see in just a minute, it's, it's pretty darn close. And so there are other factors, in fact, that impact reserves. So, for example, the uh, behavior of depositors. Suppose uh, a bunch of people deposit uh, funds in their checking accounts. Well, that's going to increase the volume of supply of reserves in the banking system. And you think, well, gosh, okay, now the Fed doesn't control depositor behavior, of course, and so that our actions affect reserves. But here's the thing to keep in mind. The Fed is really very good at offsetting any changes in outside factors that affect the volume of reserves. And that's a very important thing here. Now, we can think of two different types of reserves. Non-borrowed reserves, and these non-borrowed reserves are supplied through what's known as open market operations, and this is the buying and selling of treasury securities. And then we have borrowed reserves. Borrowed reserves are supplied through the discount window, and this is where the Fed lends reserves uh, to the banking system. And when the Fed does that, the Fed, Fed charges what's known as the discount rate. And just as a little aside here, one of the key things to keep in mind in terms of understanding the Fed as an institution is it acts as a bank for banks. So if you understand your relationship with your own bank, it, that helps you understand the Fed's relationship with other banks or with regular banks. And so what is important to keep in mind here is that the Fed has really excellent control over the non-borrowed reserves component and good control over the borrowed reserves uh, component. And this it's important to point out here is the borrowed reserves component is actually pretty modest. And so this really, really good control results in a vertical, or in other words, perfectly inelastic supply of reserves curve. So, well, you know, a perfectly inelastic supply curve isn't that unusual, but we're not done yet. Suppose this, suppose just for the sake of argument that the discount rate, in other words, the rate that the Fed charges banks to borrow reserves from them is, say, 3%. And let's imagine that the demand for reserves rises. So the demand for reserves curve we just talked about starts shifting to the right. Well, that's going to start pushing up the federal funds rate as reserves become more scarce. And so what happens when the federal funds rate hits that 3% discount rate? Well, would it go any higher? And it turns out the answer to that question is no, because instead of borrowing from other banks and paying more than 3%, banks would turn to other banks and borrow or the banks uh, would turn to the Fed and borrow at a 3% interest rate, uh, the discount rate. So it would be cheaper for the banks to borrow from the Fed. And so what happens here is that the supply of reserves curve becomes completely elastic. The Fed can loan any volume of reserves it wishes. And so the perfectly elastic component would extend almost uh, indefinitely. Now, it turns out that in practice, the Fed works pretty hard and is very good at keeping the federal funds rate below the discount rate. And so we have this very unusual supply curve that looks like an upside down capital L. And so it becomes horizontal at the discount rate here. And I apologize to everybody for my very poor handwriting. So there we go. And so in terms of uh, summarizing the supply, the Fed has excellent control over non-borrowed reserves. And so we end up with a vertical supply curve. And then once 
uh, the discount rate is hit, the supply curve becomes perfectly elastic because if it chose to, the Fed could lend any volume of reserves uh, it wishes. Now, in practice, uh, it doesn't because it usually saves the discount window for uh, a lender of last resort function. And so what we have now is we put together supply and demand and we end up with, it turns out, what's a standard normal ordinary equilibrium. So if, so for a given demand schedule and a given supply schedule, in other words, reserves supplied by the Fed. So this volume of reserves right here, we'll call that R star just for the sake of argument, that supply of reserves combined with demand results in an equilibrium federal funds rate of, say, 5%. So the key thing to keep in mind here is that in the old way that the Fed did things, the federal funds rate was determined by nothing more than standard supply and demand where the Fed influenced the supply curve. So one final point here we want to make is that uh, banks are not the only participants in the federal funds market. Um, la other large financial institutions are as well. And so the, a good way to think of the, the market there is as a market for overnight loans between very large financial institutions. So a quick summary here. So before the introduction of interest on reserves, the demand for reserves curve had a standard downward sloping component and a perfectly inelastic component. The supply curve has a perfectly inelastic component and a perfectly elastic component. And then these unusual looking supply curves work together to generate a standard normal ordinary equilibrium determination of the federal funds rate. Thank you very much.